live from the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in beautiful downtown Raleigh. It's the Science Cafe with your host, Chris Smith. All right, everybody. Hi, welcome to the museum. Hope you're all doing great. Are you doing great? Are you doing great? Yay, of course you are. You know why I know? Because you're in a science museum. And if you, <laughs> there's no better place that you could be any night of the week than the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. I know you all agree. I won't ask you to raise your hands in agreement. Yes, I, thank you. But yeah, I know, right? Being in a science museum anytime after hours is a lot of fun, especially when we're opening the doors, inviting you in, so you're actually here legally. And, but you get to come in, meet cool scientists, people studying interesting things, hang out with other people who are interested in what's going on in the world of science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And the best part about the Science Cafe is that you can grab a bite to eat in the Daily Planet Cafe. The fudge brownies are delicious. Make sure you get one of those. Have a drink, right? Listen to some science. And then also, my favorite part of every Science Cafe, ask your questions. Right? So the presentations, the way that the science cafes are built are that the presentations are a little shorter than, say, if you went to an academic conference. So you, you get some bite-sized science, and then you actually get to ask questions of the experts that we're bringing on stage. So whatever you're interested in on these topics, you get to ask your questions and hopefully learn a little bit of something. So every week, we're here every Thursday night at the science cafe, 7 o'clock right here in the Daily Planet Cafe, and every week you can learn something different. So we cover all topics in science, just about astronomy to zoology, A to Z. So you can learn something new every week right here in the Science Cafe. So this is a cool place to be. At least I am here every week, and I would be here even if they weren't paying me to get on stage. Tonight we're going to talk about fish sort of, is what I was told, fish sort of, and I'll, I'll leave the topic at that uh, because I personally don't have a lot of uh, knowledge on tonight's topic, so I'm definitely going to learn a lot at tonight's topic, but this is the second time that I have met our guest, Dr. Jeff Yoder from North Carolina State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, where he's in the Department of Molecular Biomedical Sciences. Uh, the first time, though, was... Uh, on the bank of the Noose River, I think, and it's coming back to him. And I was actually meeting up with a museum researcher, our research curator for ichthyology, study of fishes, right, um, Alex Dornberg. So Alex has been studying these ancient fish called gar. Have you heard of gar? Gar, yeah. Um, and so I met him early in the morning. Uh, it was almost a year ago, actually about a year ago, met him on the bank of the river, and we caught gar out of the river, and then we were measuring them and taking notes on how much they, what, how long they were, how much they weighed, and doing blood samples to try to sort of learn more about these really cool ancient fish. And then once it got a little bit warmer, Dr. Yoder showed up, because he, no, I'm teasing, because uh, he was actually studying another type of fish that uh, the colleagues with Wildlife Resources had also brought in, the bowfin. And I had never seen, I'm not a fisher person, so I had never actually seen gar or bowfin in the wild. We have gar here in the museum, but that's a little bit different than seeing them coming out wild of the river. And then seeing the bowfin, that fish is wild looking. In that, it just looks like a torpedo kind of a shape. So they, they look like strange alien fish because they don't look like anything else I'd ever seen. So that experience was fascinating for me to get to learn a lot, contribute to some of the data they were collecting, and sort of dip my toes into this weird world of fish and genes and DNA. And that is the world that tonight's guest speaker is fully immersed in. So, I hope you'll welcome Dr. Jeff Yoder to the stage. Give him a round of applause. That was awesome. Thank you. So, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'd like to thank the museum for inviting me here 
uh, to speak to you this evening about some of the research that we do and some of the ways that I think about science. Um, my training is in molecular biology, genetics, and immunology. So those are sort of the fields that all come together of what I'm interested in. And hopefully I can share with you um, or share with you some of the enthusiasm I have and some of the interest I have in how our immune systems are designed not only as an individual but as a species or a population and how we're designed so we can fight off that next unknown pathogen that we don't know is coming next year. So with that, I have 100 slides with chemical structures on it, so I hope you're all ready to take notes. <laughs> um, that joke didn't go very well. <laughs> so as you can see on this slide, I'm sure you've all memorized the fact that our DNA, our genomes, include about three billion bases of DNA. And what are bases? Those, if you just want to think about those four letters you learned about in school, G, C, A, and T, those are the bases, those are the nucleotides that make up our genome. Three billion pieces of information. I can't even wrap my head around how big that is, but that's the length. If you took all our chromosomes and lined them up, that's how many bases would be in our genome or are in our genome if you were to count them. So what you're looking at here, if you're not too close to a screen, you probably can't see this. But this is the sequence of a single gene from the human genome. It is a whole bunch, that gray shading in the background is actually a bunch of A, C's, G's, and T's. And then the big text on the front that you can read gives you the information that this is a single gene from the genome. It is 33,000 approximately bases in length, and that constitutes 0.00001% of your genome. Trying to put things in context here, so we start with this huge 3 billion base genome, and then we bring it back down, and now we're at a single gene in the genome, and I'll, I'll give you sort of a, my definition of what a gene is in a minute, but that is such a small, small part of the genome. Now, talking about genes, how many genes do we have in our genome? We know we, humans approximately have 20,000 genes that encode proteins. And proteins do something for our cells. And different genes make different proteins. Different cells in your body will make different types of proteins. You'll have every cell in your body makes a protein or a bunch of proteins that are important for replicating DNA. So when your cell divides, you can replicate your DNA. There are proteins in your hairs that are important for your hairs to grow and your hair follicles. So there are specific genes that turn on in your hair follicles for some of us more than others. Um, <laughs> some of us used to have more hair follicles. Um, and so all these proteins have a job to do, and they might not be expressed in every single tissue or every single cell, but we, in total, we have 20,000 genes. And so on this slide, you can see in the middle, I have this big arrow pointing to a little tiny red dot you may not be able to see that little tiny red dot, but it's so small because on the next slide, I have 20,000 red dots. So that represents the 20,000 genes in our genome. Now remember, we're not identical to each other, right? We are about 99.9% .9 identical to each other. Unless you're an identical sibling as shown in this photo on this slide, if you look to the left and you look to the right, and you're not related to the person next to you by birth, then you are not, your genomes differ by about 0.1%. And some of that is gonna be in these 20,000 genes that we all encode. So when you learn in school, oh, we all have the same DNA, it's not true. We all have DNA, we all have 99.9% .9 the same DNA. And I'm interested in how we're different and how these uh, changes specifically in the, immune, in the genes of the immune system of how that affects our immune system. So that's the path I'm going down tonight. So even though we're 99.9% .9 identical, because our genome is so big, there are three million differences between any ran two random people. That means there's three million bases that are gonna be different between me and any one of you. So that's a lot of differences. So let's take it back to this slide. If you can see on this slide, there's 20,000 red dots representing our genes, and I highlighted 20 of them with a white dot. 
and that would be 0.1% difference between individuals. Trying to use these graphics to put it into perspective for you on how similar we are, if you see all those red dots, that's how similar we are, and the white dots would represent how different we are from each other. So this 0.1%, clearly, if you look around the room, can lead to lots of differences in lots of people. And we most commonly think about what we can see. We see the physical differences between people, skin color, height, hair color, curliness of hair, those types of things that are encoded in our genome are the things that we in immediately see and think about when we talk about how we're different from each other, but we're also different from each other on the inside and our immune system. And that's what I wanna talk about. So you're all probably familiar with HIV, human immunodeficiency virus that can cause AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. There is a population, there are a number of people on the planet who are resistant to this virus. Most people would be susceptible to this virus, but there are some people who are not, and it's because their DNA is different than everybody else. And the way that the virus works, this big orange circle with these little purple spikes coming out represents what that virus would look like. And then on the bottom would be one of our immune cells. And what this virus does, it relies on a protein on the surface of our immune cells to bind onto. It latches onto a protein on the surface of our immune cells so the virus can introduce its genome into our own cells where the virus replicates. So the take home message is these people who are resistant, they have DNA differences in the gene that makes the protein that's on the surface of our immune cells that the virus binds to. So when they have these differences in that one gene, that makes them resistant to a virus. Now, lots of viruses will enter cells in different ways to infect cells. And I just use this as one example that is really striking that, you know, when HIV was first described, we thought everybody was susceptible. And then when we identified individuals who were actually resistant, geneticists could track down and figure out, well, what are the genes involved that make these people resistant, and then that helps us understand better the biology of the viruses of how is it getting into the cells. So that's my example for uh, the viral entry. And let's bring this then to the population level. So if we all have different DNA sequences, 0.1% different, that's gonna affect our genes. And I'm specifically thinking now about the genes that are important for recognizing pathogens. The genes we all have that are important for recognizing a virus or a virally infected cell or recognizing a, a, a bacteria. And these we call, they're usually except, expressed on the cell surface and so I'm gonna probably talk to them, talk about them as receptors because they're receptors on the cell surface and their job is to recognize pathogens. Um, so this little graphic I made, I spent a lot of time on these animations so I hope you like them. In the middle, all these smiley faces, they just represent any population that you want. Um, and the pink and the green individuals just represent individuals with a little bit different DNA than everybody else. And then let's ask a question. What happens if a new pathogen comes along and this whole population is exposed to this pathogen? And we'll call it pathogen A. If you look closely, um, the, peop the individuals who are pink or purple in this slide are the ones that have the genes to be resistant to that pathogen. So when that pathogen is introduced, all the happy smiles become frowns, if you can see that on this slide, except those who have the resistance gene. They survive, and it's really sad for everybody else on the individual level. It's unfortunate those individuals did not survive that pathogen, they got sick, they got infected, they got sick, and they died but some of the population survived because of this DNA difference they had. That's good for the species. That species lives on from those individuals who survived that pathogen, and we know because they had the right gene set, they're now resistant to this pathogen, so that pathogen will never be a problem for that species again. So, just to repeat, let's imagine another population on another part of the planet, or maybe on another continent they're exposed to a different pathogen, pathogen B. So we're starting with the same group of individuals, 
exposed to a different pathogen, and in this case, only these individuals are able to resist and the infection and survive. But again, this is important so that the species lives on. So there is this genetic, this genetic diversity we have in our immune genes is actually really important because it provides a population protection from the next new unknown pathogen. So that then leads me to talk about my favorite immune cell that we all have. We all have natural killer cells, which is a, a fun name to say uh, about a, an immune cell. So you probably all have heard of leukocytes or white blood cells or soldier cells. Natural killer cells are one type of those that we all have in our bodies. And their job is to go through your whole body and sort of inspect every other cell in your body and determine, is this a normal cell or is this an, an abnormal cell that I should kill? And those abnormal cells typically are cancerous cells and virally infected cells. So that's the main job of our natural killer cells, is to rec recognize cells that have become infected or cells that have been cancerous. And then natural killer cells can actually release enzymes that directly kill those cells. So when your immune system is working properly, those types of cells will be killed off. As we all know, our immune system is not perfect, so there are times we become infected and there are times where we get cancer. So it's not a perfect system, but then if you think about how many times did maybe you have a viral infection and it was, those cells were quickly killed by natural killer cells, you may have never even known you had a viral infection because your immune system killed it before that virus could spread. So there are two types of receptors on the surface of natural killer cells. Now remember, we talk, I started talking about the genome and the 20,000 genes in the genome, and each gene encodes a protein Right? So with each gene encoding a protein, I'm focusing on the proteins that we call receptors that are on the surface of natural, on these natural killer cells. And there are two types. There are receptors that will activate the natural killer cell, and there are receptors that will inhibit the function of these natural killer cells. And so I've color-coded them here on this little slide. The red one on the top with this little a uh, circular shape would be an inhibitory receptor, and the one below is an activating receptor. Well, what does this mean? Let's, let's pretend we're looking at a natural killer cell here on the slide. It, natural killer cells have both types of receptors, and this is important because almost all of our cells in our body will express a marker of self. It's a protein that all our cells express, and it's recognized by these inhibitory receptors. So when a natural killer cell comes up on any cell in your body and it detects this marker of self, which is just one of a protein encoded by a different gene in your genome, it knows this is a normal cell, I'm gonna leave it alone, I'm not gonna hurt it. But if that target cell, oh, excuse me, so the question is, would the natural killer cell kill the target cell? And the answer is no, it would leave it alone. But now let's say the target cell is expressing a new protein on the surface shown here with a triangle shape that can be recognized by this activating receptor. This would be a marker of non-self, and this could be a virally encoded protein that ends up on the surface, or it could be a stress-related protein. When cells become cancerous or become infected, a lot of times they'll put stress proteins on the surface as a marker for the immune system to recognize them. And what do you think is gonna happen if a natural killer cell comes in contact with a target cell that has this non-self marker. It's gonna attack it and kill it. That's how they got their name, as being natural killer cells. Because they don't need antibodies, they don't need vaccination, they can just do one cell to one cell, recognize that this is an abnormal cell and kill it directly. So that's how they got their names. So I'm really interested in natural killer cells. I'm interested in the genetic diversity of these receptors and how we're different with our natural killer cell receptors, because as you'll see, we're quite different person to person. So in the human genome, on chromosome 19, there is a cluster of genes that all look very similar to each other. They all encode surface proteins. Um, shown here, again, there's inhibitory forms shown down on the bottom here. And in this individual sequence, there's one activating form up on top. What you're looking at at the bottom, this is actually a cartoon representation of part of human chromosome 19. And each circle 
represents a single gene in someone's genome, and the name of the gene is above it. The names are not important, but this is to show you that this is real, this is part of our genome. We have these clusters, we all have these clusters of genes, and we all have inhibitory and activating receptors. But what's different is when you go into different individuals and you look at their genomic sequence, different people have different combinations of genes at this one locus. So this, the first time I learned this, it blew my mind because I learned, oh, we're all 99.9% .9 identical, so we all must have the same set of genes. But when you actually get down into this part of the human genome, and there are a few other immune genes like this, these families of genes, we're actually different. Some of us have more of these receptors than other people. And again, each circle represents an individual gene, at, but at the same part of the genome. And there's seven rows or seven lines on this slide, and those are the seven most common sequences found in the human population. There are a lot more combinations of genes that are not on this slide. So what does this mean on the individual level? Remember, we're all diploids. We all have two copies of DNA, one from mom and one from dad. So that means each person in this room has two sets of these combinations of genes. So you can mix and match these combinations of genes to come up with a different sets of these receptors that are able to differentiate. Remember, these genes encode proteins that are receptors to tell the difference between self and non-self. And they're expressed on natural killer cells. Should the natural killer cell kill or not? And this is really important, so if a cell is virally infected, do you have the right receptor to recognize a cell if it's infected with this new virus or not? And there's a strength to this, again, remember, on the population level that we have these different sets of genes. So as I said, most people will possess different combinations of natural killer cell receptors. So how does this occur? So this is sort of, this is a model I was not there to witness evolutionary time. So this is a model of what we think happened, of how we got to this point. Because you ask yourself, why don't we all have the same set of genes? We've all sort of evolved from the same in common uh, uh, ancient species. So this is the model that scientists have come up with, is that we start out with some ancestral individual probably had a single NK receptor gene that duplicated. And this can happen when DNA polymerase, when it's copying your DNA, it can make mistakes, and so maybe there is a slippage, and you end up making two copies of this gene, and they end up right next to each other in the genome. And you can see they're both red. The, the progenitor gene was red, and the copies are, gene, are, are they're identical, so I color-coded them red. Now, evolutionary time goes on, and then one of those genes on the right undergoes mutations. And one of them can undergo mutations because remember, we started with one copy of this gene, so it's probably essential. It's really important everybody has a copy of this gene. So as long as you maintain one copy that looks the same and does the same thing, that second copy can change. It can mutate. Its DNA can change, which will change the protein, which is the receptor, that can then bind something new maybe. So in some cases, that can happen where the red becomes a yellow in this example. And I have another example where that red gene duplicates again, so now we're building our multi-gene cluster on human chromosome 19. And then after that, you can have uh, maybe two populations of people uh, or individuals that moved away from each other, and they're exposed to different pathogens. So there are gonna be different selective pressures on those different groups of people and their genomes of what genes do they have. And so in this example, you can see, well, you can see in the left side that you're maintaining the two red and the one yellow. And the same is true on the right side. Sorry, my eyes, I, I have to look at that screen for this. Um, but then what can happen is you can have gene loss, and that is actually called the death of a gene. And that ex example is right over here with this yellow gene. Maybe it wasn't so useful to this population, so it gets lost from its genome. And then the red duplicates again. 
But over here, this is a different population, so maybe the yellow is actually really useful, so it's maintained and it's duplicated. So now you've got two copies of this gene in this population based on the pathogen history for that population. And then this process can go on and on where you end up having different combinations of genes in different populations. But as you know, people are mobile, we move around. Um, and again, this is one model. There are probably multiple models, but this is my favorite model of how we got to this point where different people were the same species, but we have different combinations of these genes based on the evolutionary history of the pathogens we've seen based on where we've lived or what we've been exposed to. And this would be true for any species, not just humans. This is true for any species with the experience of how their immune genes are being shaped by the, your pathogen history as a species. So this is all human, and I know fish was in my title. And I do use fish as a model. I use zebrafish as an experimental model in my research lab. And um, we've also started doing some research on the genomes of, of gars and bowfin as well. And I'll tell you why is because, well, we're interested in the process of how these genes, gene families uh, diversify. And we're interested in the function of them and uh, are there functional consequences of this. But we're not going to do these studies in humans, but we can do them in fish. And we can do them in zebrafish. And it turns out, so the question is, can we, this process be modeled in other species? The answer is yes. And why is fish a relevant model? Well, we all used to be fish, right? 450 million years ago, they were just fish. Some of those fish decided they were going to come up on land. And those would be the lobe fin fished, shown on this side here, which includes the coelacanth, which you may know, and also leads to the tetrapods that includes us. Now, the fish that decided to stay in the water are the ray fin fish, shown on the left over here. And that includes up here on the Top would be fish like zebrafish, and the fish you'd probably eat at a restaurant like salmon and tilapia and trout. Those are all uh, ray fin fish. Um, but more ancient fish down here, gars and bowfin and bashirs, those are species my lab is now starting to work on because these are ancient fish. Darwin referred to them as living fossils, and that's because their genomes evolved really, really slow compared to other fish and compared to mammals. So we're using those fish to sort of model to get a better grasp on the rate of evolution and how fast are these gene families, these gene clusters evolving. So I'll show you just one slide on why zebrafish is a great lab animal model. It's easy to maintain. They're easy to breed. We can get about 100 to 200 embryos from one mating pair in a the morning. Their development is really, really fast. So we can um, go through about three generations in one year in the lab. They're affordable. You can buy them from the pet store for about $2. And if you go upstairs to where the glowfish tank is, those are zebrafish. Those are transgenic zebrafish expressing fluorescent protein. Um, and there's a reference genome. The first vertebrate genome to be sequenced was human, and then the mouse, and then the zebrafish. So that's how important the world looks at zebrafish as a model for human health. And we love the fact we have a reference genome. So when we start looking at different uh, zebrafish from different populations, we can then have a comparison where we have the whole reference genome to look back at. And we can do things, we can make fish sick, we can do infections with them and determine with this gene combination, are they more susceptible to infections? Or with that gene infection, are they more susceptible or resistant to infections? So this is just a gene cluster in zebrafish. I'm not going to talk about it, but we've done, I've been working on this for more than 10 years. I put a lot of work into this, but we think that this cluster of genes in zebrafish function like natural killer cell receptors. I spent a lot of time telling you about how they function in human because so much more work has been done in human, but we think that fish have a similar process. They have what appear to be natural killer cells, and we think that these genes these gene clusters, they, have, they share all the characteristics with human natural killer cell receptors. So we're starting to use zebrafish as a model to understand the function of these receptors and how is this gene and genome divers, diversification happening. So back to my title, I talked about coevolution. I talked about the humans and our genome and 
20,000 genes, we have all these receptors, we have different immune receptors. But why is it so important that we have so many? And one of the main reasons that we think we have so many of these receptors, and they're different from person to person to person, is because pathogens typically, they grow so fast. The doubling time for a bacteria in optimal conditions is 20 minutes. It can double its population in 20 minutes. And so on the left here, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but the idea is that you can go from a single bacterial cell to about a million bacterial cells in seven hours. Every time that bacteria divides, it's replicating its DNA. Each time it replicates its DNA, it can introduce changes in its DNA, which changes its proteins. So it might look a little different. So we maybe, we have a receptor to recognize that first bacteria, but maybe 1% of the progeny have changed so we can no longer recognize that bacteria because it has changed so fast. On the right side, I took the assumption that if you're human population, two individuals would have two children every 20 years. So that takes, what was the number? In 100 years, we'd be up to about 30 people. And each time, so that's 20 years or so, that we get a chance to change our DNA. Because when you have kids, you pass your DNA on to your kids, but your DNA is being, it's being changed a little bit. There are changes from it that's good that go to your kids. And so, but that's every 20 years that you have a chance, and the, and the species has a chance as a population to modify our genome to respond to these pathogens. So that's the reason we think we have so many of these receptors is because let's have lots of these receptors because we don't know what the next pathogen is. And we've learned from the evolutionary perspective that we need to have a lot because pathogens can change so, so quickly. So this is, I uh, think, a second to last slide. And so this, I just wanna put everything sort of in a more global context. We talked about DNA, but I wanted to remind you, yes, we have DNA, but pathogens have DNA as well which can change over time. As, and so on the right, or excuse me, the left, we have this, in this case, let's call it a bacteria, which has its own genome, and it can infect a person. While it's in a person, its genome can change because it's proliferating, it's replicating itself. So you start maybe with one bacteria that infects you, but it's some of the progeny could change its genome, and so maybe, you could, your receptors might recognize some, your receptors might not recognize others. And let's say you just have a, an infection, you get a little weak, you have a little a cough or something, you go to work or you go to school and then you sneeze or you cough and then you pass this pathogen onto a bunch of other people and maybe some people, you know, they'll be infected, maybe they'll just have a little cold or something and maybe some of you go to a farm because you're gonna go to a pumpkin patch or you're gonna go on a hayride. And you say, oh, look, it's a, a field of cows. Let's go look at the cows. And in some, some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, that bacteria could also go into a cow or some other animal, whether it be agricultural animal or a wild animal. And then it could be propagated in those species where it can change more. And then it could be transferred from species to species. And so this is a whole field that I don't work on, but I just wanted to share this idea with you of the idea that pathogens can spread, and especially from in the human species, with airplanes flying all over the planet now, if one person is sick in one part of the world, they infect a couple people, they travel all around the world, and before we even know that first person is sick, that pathogen has traveled around the world, which is something of great, great concern to epidemiologists. So I don't want to end on a downer. <laughs> But uh, because we're all here and we're, we're thriving quite well as a species on this planet. So I just wanted to recap by saying, you know, this 0.1% difference, not only does it make us look different in different ways and it gives some of us maybe, uh, you know, different characteristics on the outside. It also reflects differences on the inside, including our immune genes that make these receptors that recognize pathogens. And, um, and I think that's a good thing from the population level so that whether it's human species or any other species on the planet, that they will thrive and survive.
And with that, I thank you for your time and uh, be happy to answer any questions. I will do the best I can to answer your questions. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jeff. So if you have questions, I know somebody does, just let me know. You'll do that by raising your hand. And the way Q&A works is I have a mic, and Katie over there has a mic. And we'll bring a microphone to you so that everyone in the room can hear the questions, just like we'll be able to hear the answers. Um, so as we go, track us down. OK, there are some hands. Good. And we'll try to get to as many as we can. And we've got plenty of time. So I'll get started right here in the front. I know that uh, immunotherapy is being used today to treat various forms of cancer. Can you comment or explain some of that? I could give you, so I don't work on immunotherapy. So remember, I work with fish primarily, I, but I understand a lot of the human genome aspect. So what the immunotherapy is giving antibodies to, that would be specifically targeted. So the idea is, can you use immunotherapy for cancer treatment? And the answer is they're trying. And the idea is that cancer cells, remember I talked about if a cancer cell can be stressed out, sometimes there are unique markers that get expressed on the surface of cancer cells. If we can develop antibodies that will specifically recognize those proteins that don't have any adverse effects on the patient, then yes, you could be basically directing your immune cells to specifically target and kill just the cancer cells. That's the idea behind it. So um, I know you said that all this diversity, and I'm curious if because of globalization, because all of these different isolated sections of humanity are interbreeding, and because uh, diseases are traveling so fast and getting to the entire world, basically, if eventually we're going to see that the genome for that is going to become a lot more uniform, and there won't be as much variety in it. I'm I don't think so, because in every generation, we're introducing new diversity. So when you're developing, whether it's being sperm or oocytes through the process of meiosis, that's when you can have a lot of new recombination that's being introduced for more genetic variation. So I don't think we're going to, you know, we, we might become more homogenous in some ways, but there's always going to be each new generation, there's going to be new changes to the genome. So I'm not too concerned about that. It's a good question, though. Did you find any uh, new variations in genes within the zebrafish that you uh, studied? And how successful were they comparatively? Like, So that's a great question. So that is about probably 10 years worth of work of that question uh, because we're starting from scratch. So we were the first to identify uh, these genes in the zebrafish genome right when they were starting to sequence the zebrafish genome. We have found a lot of differences between from zebrafish um, there are different experimental lines of zebrafish, and they're really very different from each other. And we've found differences, and we're now, we're getting close to a point where we can start doing some functional experiments with them to determine if you have this genetic setup of genes or receptors, are you more resistant to an infection than this setup? Um, we haven't done those experiments yet, but those are experiments I definitely want to do. That's, so that's a great idea. How many genes in the human are there that are involved in this uh, resistance to disease? Right. So I would say at least hundreds of genes are involved in being proteins that are explicitly on the cell surface it, with its job of detecting things like cancerous cells, dying cells, virally infected cells, or even directly recognizing bacteria directly. Um, and so we have hundreds. I, I, it, it might be approaching th thousands. If you talk about the whole immune system, there's thousands of genes, because even genes that are important for cell proliferation, they're important for immune response. But they're not involved in actually directly recognizing pathogens, but the, the receptors, the genes that are involved in directly recognizing pathogen, I would say there's hundreds of them. And what goes wrong with children who are born essentially with no immune system? Because they got the genes for that from their parents, but... Right. So there's two ways that can happen. 
that kids, so one example would be SCID individuals, which is severe combined immunodeficiency, where, and these individuals cannot make any antibodies. And there are mutations in about 10 different genes that can cause this because they disrupt the same pathway for antibody production. So one way this can happen is the two parents, remember we have two copies of each gene, so mom and dad potentially could be carriers for these, a mutation in a gene. You don't see that in the parents because they've got one good copy, one bad copy. But then, unfortunately, if they have children, they've got a 25% chance that one of their kids would be carrying both bad copies from both parents. So you would not know it looking at the parents. Uh, you would only know it by looking at, unless you sequence their genome, um, until you see the kid that's born that way. And so that would be one scenario. The other scenario is it's highly unlikely that mom and dad are both going to create mutations in the same gene to give to their kid, but it could be one parent's a carrier and one parent in that meiosis for their sperm or their egg, it ends up causing a mutation in that same gene. So that would be a second way where one parent is a true carrier and the other one it's a spontaneous mutation that leads to that. Thank you. Sure. So I'm curious, does the diversity of immune receptors in a, in a human, or the diversity that we see across the human population, are we actually outrunning the rate of new pathogens to attack our immune systems? So that is an outstanding question. Thank you. With a complicated answer. Um, and the complication comes in from, so we know what the, well, we don't really know what the diversity of pathogens are on the planet right now. We know what we know about things that are infecting us. Um, and as we also probably noticed that there's something going around polio-like that we don't yet have a grasp on. So that's a new thing that just showed up like this last, well, they've, they're giving a name to it within the last couple weeks. So I would also argue with uh, climate change, you're changing temperatures and certain pathogens will thrive in different environments. And so as climate changes, pathogens can move into new, niche, new niches or new environments. And so there are populations, and this is something my collaborator Alex Dornberg and I have talked about. We actually are gonna do some studies with Antarctic ice fish that are an isolated population of fish. We're concerned about with increasing water temperatures, new pathogens can start encroaching and moving into parts of Antarctica. And are these fish gonna be prepared? We, we won't know the answer, but we wanna look at the diversity of the genes in these Antarctic ice fish to try to come up with a model. If new pathogens start showing up there because the water temperature is rising, that could be a problem. So it's complicated based on not only what is on the planet where we live, but as temperatures change, there's the potential that pathogens can move around. Um, into places where they never were before. There's a lot of things that can change in a very short yeah. amount of time. Yeah. To keep track. How do you keep track of all that? I don't. You don't? Okay. No. I, we make models and draw circles. <laughs> oh, yeah, and the smiley face. And the smiley, yeah. Yeah. And so I want to get back to Gar. Yep. Because I think they're really cool fish. And I've started to try to learn a little bit more about them. Yeah. Um, I haven't learned anything new about the bowfin. But so what, when you go and, like you're studying zebrafish right. in a lab. Yep. Zebrafish have been in labs for years now. We have the whole genome. But what about for bringing wild fish out and you really don't know what you're going to get right. in their DNA? So, and that's why, so one of the issues with zebrafish is it's just one species of fish, and there's 30,000, there's about 60,000 vertebrates on the planet that we know about, and half of them are fish, so there's about 30,000 fish that we know about on the planet, and we've been looking at one for about 15 years. And um, it really got me thinking, are we looking at the rule, or are we looking at the exception by looking at zebrafish? Is this just a unique feature of these fish that we're looking at? So we started looking at other genomes as more fish genomes were being sequenced, um, we could start looking at things like carp and trout and salmon and pufferfish and compare. And we've discovered that these immune receptors that we think are and natural killer receptors in zebrafish, we can find them in all fish that we've looked at that have genomic resources. We can find them. But then you remember on my slide, gars and bowfin are even more ancient. They're slowly evolving. And 
we didn't know if they would have these same genes, and it turns out that one of the GAR species had its genome sequenced a couple years ago, and we helped annotate the immune genes, and we found these same receptors in GAR. And so they're there, but now we're interested in this question of the gen genetic diversity. So we've been collecting DNA samples from GAR on this side of the Appalachian Mountains from different, we've been out on the Haw River and Cape Fear, and I think one other river. And we've also been out to the French Broad River on the other side of the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee, and we've collected some GAR from out there. Now the Appalachian Mountains creates a physical barrier between these two populations, so we're presuming that GAR are not jumping over the mountain one way or the other, so we've got isolated populations. They're the same species, but they've been isolated for a very long time. And initial data that we have, where this is an ongoing project, initial data says it's different sets of genes, different sets of receptors on the two sides of the Appalachian Mountain. Cool. So, it's me. Yeah. I have a question that you do your work in the veterinary school. Yes. Is this same kind of work being done in other settings? I mean, why? The, well, the veterinary school is because of the fish, right. I guess, but they, they must be doing it in labs, and is it just the model animal that put you in the veterinary school? So it was, what got me to the veterinary school was uh, expertise with immunology. They were looking for faculty with expertise in immunology, so I could, I brought my research program there so that I could do the research and teach um, as well. And the GARs were just a bonus for me because if I was at a, most likely if I was at a human medical school doing research there, there's no way that I would have fish tanks big enough to hold gar. So the gar we've been collecting are about two foot long. And we have tanks at the vet school to hold like a whole bunch, because we have faculty who do research on koi. Um, we use koi, I think, to teach aquatic medicine uh, to vet students. And so we have tanks that are about four foot tall, maybe eight foot in diameter that we can bring in gar that we've collected from the rivers and we can house about four or five of them at a time. And one thing that we've done is we take it, you can get DNA out of their blood samples so we can draw blood out of these gar, put them back to the tank, let them hang out for a little bit longer. Um, with the ultimate goal, we wanna move, I'm hoping to move the, my experimental models down the road where we can actually do functional, take blood cells out of these fish because they're big. A disadvantage of zebrafish is they're about two inches long we have to kill the fish to get blood out of them if we want to get any blood. And it's a tiny, tiny amount of blood we can get out of one of these little fish. And we've done it, we could do that, but a gar is two foot long and we can pull three mils of blood easy, put them back in the tank, they're happy, they're swimming around. We can go back two weeks later, pull more blood from that same fish and repeat an experiment. So it's an advantage of the gar is that we're not euthanizing, we're reducing the numbers of fish we're actually euthanizing by playing with the gar. Um, and I'm hopeful that we can start doing actually cell biology experiments with the blood from the gar, which we would never be able to do with zebrafish. I was wondering, we, we've we been talking about sort of humans keeping up with the pathogens. Right. Um, but I was thinking about, with, with something like CRISPR, we always hear about the Cas9 right. coming from, I believe, the pathogens, is that correct? That's correct. So are the pathogens I guess the question is, are the pathogens actively trying to subvert these genes as well? Absolutely. So uh, a lot of people refer to it as an arms race between pathogens and the host, and that we're trying to outrun the changes in the, the, the pathogens, and the pathogens are trying to outrun our adaptations to recognizing the pathogens. And so CRISPR is a very unique thing. And I do want to point out, I don't want to talk trash about all, all bacteria because not all bacteria are bad, and nothing really gets me more upset when I hear on the news about uh, newscasters talking about, oh, this E. coli uh, like uh, outbreak. I'm like, okay, well, it's, in a, it's a specific strain of E. coli that's causing it. Lots of E. coli is really good for us, and there are a lot of bacteria that are really commensals for, you know, to help us digest food, et cetera. So I don't, wanna, I don't want you to go away thinking all microbes are bad because lots of microbes are really, really good for us. But the pathogenic ones that can cause disease are the ones that we're of, of, are of concern. So the CRISPR-Cas9, is that's an actual, in a lot of bacteria, and some are pathogenic and some are not, it is part of their immune system to recognize viruses that would infect the bacteria. So that is their immune system, because they'll steal snippets of DNA out of a, a virus that can infect bacteria, recognize that DNA, and if they get infected with that bacterial virus, 
they recognize the DNA and destroy it. So it's actually an immune system for the bacteria to recognize bacterial viruses. And then we humans and like chemical engineers have realized this, how this system works, and they're applying it now to modify genomes, to cause mutations in genomes or to modify genomes. And we're actually using the CRISPR-Cas9 system in the lab in zebrafish to knock out some of these immune genes. So if we disrupt the function of some of these immune genes, does that make the zebrafish more susceptible to different types of pathogens? I know that in mice there are specific strains you can get that yep. have been bred for that, which are missing various genes, making them more susceptible to particular things. Right. Is anything like that being done with the zebrafish? No. And the reason being, so whoever decided working with mice was really, really smart and really, really lucky. Because you can get these mice, they bred them to basically be completely inbred. Both copies of every gene was identical. So you had these really purebred strains of mice that had diff different characteristics. And if you look at their immune gene repertoires, I didn't show a slide on that tonight, but they're completely different. These NK receptors, very different from mouse strain to mouse strain to mouse strain. And it's known that certain strains of mice, like you said, are more susceptible to different infections. Um, people have tried to do that in zebrafish, but there's this issue in general, and I think maybe mice are an exception, or the fact that we house them in such clean facilities that they don't get exposed to a lot of pathogens. We house our zebrafish in tanks, you know, we try to keep them, keep them as clean as possible, but we need a biofilter in our fish tanks, and a biofilter is a bunch of bacteria that helps break down all the waste products and the extra food. So we have bacteria in our fish tanks. So the bottom line is people have tried to make genetically inbred zebrafish, and they end up being really poor at breeding, and they're not healthy. And so they, they're not useful from the experimental perspective because you just can't, if they just don't do well. They don't thrive. So what would be your, your next step? What are you looking, 10 more years of zebrafish, right. what are you hoping happens? So what I tell my graduate students who work with me now, that I'm hoping that I can prove before I retire that fish have true natural killer cells and that the receptors we're studying, that we have functional proof that these are indeed natural killer cell receptors. So that's gonna require a lot of, I think, genome editing within zebrafish lines and a lot of biochemical studies, et cetera. So that's one aspect we're going down. But right now, we're really focused on actually the gars and the bowfin. We have funding that we're sequencing a second species, we're sequencing the, the entire genome of a second species of gar, the long-nosed gar that lives here in North Carolina. And we're sequencing, we're collaborating on a project for sequencing the bowfin genome. Because um, we're really interested in looking at those species, again, because of their, uh, slowly evolving, and so that's the more genomic-y aspect is with GARS and bowfin. The more functional stuff is with zebrafish. I think we've got time for one more. Why were zebrafish picked versus some larger fish? That is a great question, and it's because they're small, um, is one of the reasons. So here are the, here's the, the elevator answer. For, for the elevator discussion of why we chose zebrafish. And it was one guy out of the University of Oregon really decided he wanted a new genetic model. So he decided on zebrafish because one, they were cheap. Two, they were small, so you could house lots of them in a small space. Three, their embryos are transparent. So you can actually watch the one cell embryo divide to two cells, divide to four cells, to 16, all the way up till you can see a beating heart and blood cells in circulation at 20, and it's a fast development. So at 24 hours, my graduate students love this, and I'm sure they'll love that I'm telling the story, is this zebrafish went from a single cell yesterday morning, today it has a beating heart and bloods in circulation. What did you do in the last day? <laughs> so that is a major advantage. So it was started out as a developmental biology model organism for all those reasons, cheap, transparent, easy to care. People had been using, you know, pet store or pet fish enthusiasts have been using zebrafish for a long time just as a hobby. And so he just adapted that. And then 
he maintained the embryos at a specific temperature for specific amounts of time, and he documented at this temperature they'll develop this far, and at, at six hours they'll look like this, and he really wrote the book on what the stages of development would look like, and then everybody started referring back to that. Let's give him one more round of applause. Say thank you. Thank you. Awesome job. Thanks so much. And hey, thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. I hope you enjoyed the Science Cafe this evening. I hope you'll come back again next Thursday night and hang out with us again here in the Daily Planet Cafe. But of course, next Thursday is the 1st of November, I think. It's the first, no. Next Thursday is the 25th. And we're doing animal locomotion. You won't want to miss it. I got excited for trivia tonight. I thought it was going to be trivia. Well, hey, there's something new to learn next Thursday here at the Science Cafe. And I should probably let it go with that. Good night, everybody.